Next speaker is Angelo Ricarte, revealing the signatures of black hole seeding. All right, uh, thanks for letting me give a talk. So my name is Angelo Ricarte. I'm a graduate student here, uh, not here, at Yale University, working with free nitrogen. And uh, today I'll be telling you about a paper that is currently in review about revealing the signatures of supermassive black hole seeding using a different technique from uh, Colin de Graff. Uh, here we use semi-analytic models, uh, which I've been developing as my thesis over the past few years. So semi-analytic models attempt to combine everything that we know about formation and the fueling of black holes uh, in order to self-consistently and rapidly, rapidly produce a suite of different observables. And we're interested only in the black hole part. And so uh, the galaxy part of the, of the model I take just uh, from the current empirical modeling. I actually use the abundance matching results from uh, most are at all 2013 and have been recently convinced to try the uh, new galaxy or universe machine instead. Uh, but in any case, we combine that with uh, some physical prescriptions about the seeding and accretion and dynamics and put it through the machinery in order to produce things like the black hole host relations and luminosity functions, things that we use to calibrate the model, uh, as well as produce things that are less constrained and perhaps not uh, observed at all yet, such as the gravitational waves that will be produced by LISA. So our merger trees go down to 5 times 10 to the 6 solar masses at redshift of 20 using press Schechter techniques. And this allows us to get down to those halos which form the first seeds. And one realization of the universe with this model takes a few hours if I use a few of the, of the department's cores. And uh, the downside of doing merger trees this way is that there's no direct spatial information. and uh, uh, on the other hand, um, we're able to rapidly probe a large number of recipes and uh, different parameters. And so it's important to understand the ingredients that go into this model for you to uh, take anything that I say seriously after this. So here I have a little animated cartoon about how we uh, try and assemble a black hole that uh, exists in a host halo of some mass uh, by redshift of zero. So under the assumption of black hole and host galaxy coevolution, the first thing I want to know is how this host halo formed its mass over cosmic time. Step one is to generate that merger tree going out to redshift of 20, resolving these, the halos in which the first seeds form. Since we're interested in black holes, that seeding is the next step. And I'll be talking about differentiating between heavy seeds, uh, the direct collapse case, versus light seeds from POP3s. I'm not going to talk about the uh, intermediate case from uh, the uh, merging clusters of stars, uh, which should probably fall in between the results from these, from these two models. So every time a mer major merger occurs in this model, we say that a quasar turns on until that supermassive black hole blows away its gas supply. And we say that happens when it reaches some maximum mass given by the M sigma relation. So naturally, we do land on M sigma by z equals zero as uh, as is um, expected. Uh, but the evolution of sigma as a function of uh, halo and uh, halo mass and redshift is really important for uh, getting luminosity functions correct as you go to higher redshift. Uh, and so halos will merge after a dynamical friction time scale. Their supermassive black holes may also merge. And you just keep uh, following this process until you get to redshift of zero saving any interesting pr uh, properties that you want to know about along the way, especially things like the bolometric luminosity, Eddington ratios, black hole masses, etc. cetera. Uh, but this was just for one realization of the assembly of this halo and only one halo mass. So we repeat this process for a variety of different halo masses a few times each in order to probe cosmic variants. And we're focusing on distinguishing between these uh, two broad classes of seeds and uh, there are really two um, main salient properties of these seeding models that are important, uh, which are the abundance and the initial masses in this model. 
So these kind of pictures in the background are what you should have in mind. POP3 remnants are assumed to have higher abundance but lower masses. Uh, we draw from some IMF and put in a black hole of up to about 100 solar masses into any halo that's above a 3.5 sigma peak. Whereas the heavy seeds are assumed to have lower abundance owing to the rarity of conditions required to, to make them, uh, but higher masses, up to say 10 to the 5 solar masses. The mass here depends on the virial temperature and the spin, and is that same model that uh, Colin DeGraff just brought up, uh, low dato in 2006, whereby a protogalactic disk goes tomb ray unstable and uh, drives a mass flow to the center of the, gal of the proto galaxy, which is assumed to all uh, assemble a black hole. And so let's take a look at some of the signatures that uh, may exist in the observations existing or to come, which may uh, contain some signatures that uh, encode the seeding properties. And as we've already seen from Colin's talk, these are going to exist both at low masses uh, currently uh, at, at, in the current epoch and uh, at high redshifts. So first, here's the uh, local M sigma relation for the two classes of models. Light seeds are on top, and those are always going to be the warm colors. Heavy seeds are on bottom and the cool colors. And uh, there are also two different columns here. Uh, PL and MS correspond to different steady modes here. Uh, so I brought up when uh, in the cartoon earlier that uh, major mergers in this model are assumed to drive the dominant mode of black hole growth. Uh, but when that isn't happening, we also assume that a, a steady mode may also be in, in progress. Uh, these PL modes assume a universal power law Eddington ratio distribution, and that allows us to uh, reproduce the behavior of the low redshift luminosity functions. While these uh, MS things, um, these MS variants, set the black hole accretion rate to a thousandth the star formation rate uh, instead, uh, which may be the case uh, if you believe in a, a connection between the black hole accretion rate and the star formation rate. And so previous models, uh, Voluntary et al. 2009, claim that the uh, low sigma scatter, low mass, low sigma scatter may encode the seeding mechanism, where the heavy seeds have a higher scatter at this end than the light seeds. Uh, we don't see such a clear picture in our model. Uh, here we find that the differences are mainly driven by the uncertainties in the accretion prescription. You change the accretion model that dominates at the low mass end, you'll change whatever scatter you, you get uh, at that end as well. Uh, however, the occupation fraction, the fraction of points which end up in, on this plot at all, still remains relevant, uh, although that's much more difficult for an observer to measure than for a theorist to predict from merger trees. Now moving to uh, the high redshift end, uh, you also see signatures here and here we've calibrated the model so that we are able to reproduce quasars at redshift of 6. Uh, if you push past this redshift frontier, you start to see qualitative differences that appear in the luminosity functions depending on the seeding prescription. And both of those two salient uh, features of the seeding model appear here. If you look at redshift of 10, for example, uh, you see that the uh, light seeds have many more low luminosity AGN, the heavy seeds have more high luminosity AGN. The reason for this is that the higher occupation fraction of the light seeds uh, causes them to create more low luminosity AGN in the lower mass halos, whereas the higher initial masses of those heavy seeds allowed them to reach higher masses and therefore higher luminosities earlier in the universe than those light seeds. And so a Lynx deep field, for example, could tell us about uh, the seeding mechanism, this uh, dashed blue line is the uh, limit of a Lynx deep field if 10% of the flux was uh, radiated in the x-ray. However, there are degeneracies that have to do with the accretion. So remember I said we assumed that uh, when a merger occurs, a black hole turns on at the Eddington rate. And so changing the duty cycle or the uh, average Eddington ratio will move these curves around as well. And so it's important to uh, model as many different things as possible in order to produce a self-consistent picture and break degeneracies. Uh, one thing that is broken in the SAM, for example, is this occupation fraction, which ends up being related to the occupation fraction at redshift of zero, since we, since we set the, um, the seeding epoch to be much higher redshift than this, 15 or 20, uh, based on when uh, there are insufficient metals to um, 
prevent the uh, formation of these seeds. Now, before we get to these uh, high redshift luminosity functions, uh, there, there, uh, some amount of that information may be preserved in cosmic backgrounds. Uh, and here's a plot that shows the total amount of mass locked up in black holes uh, for the light and heavy seeds as a function of redshift. The filled curves show the amount of mass that's locked up by accretion, which is relevant for, say, the X-ray background. While these uh, dashed lines show you the total amount of mass, um, including the seed mass. And for the heavy seeds, that seed mass ends up uh, being dominant for the early universe. And it turns out that these light seeds produce a factor of, uh, of about two more, of a, more X-ray background from redshift greater than 6 AGN. That's uh, simply owing to the uh, overall occupation fraction of the, of the light seeds. Uh, but you need to know the typical SED and the observation in particular reliably to turn uh, an X-ray background into a total mass density accreted. Uh, one interesting thing is that the heavy seeds have a, a higher bias because they're assumed to be in uh, higher mass halos. Um, exploring uh, the clustering signature will be a subject of future work. Now, of course, gravitational waves will also give us a very clear picture into um, the seeding mechanism. So here I've done distributions as a function of chirp mass on the left and uh, redshift on the right here. And essentially, if heavy seeds dominate the creation of black holes, you should see a power law that just keeps going to lower masses. Whereas for the heavy seeds, you should see a drop off that is just based on the uh, heavy seed IMF. All right, so in conclusion, there are signatures of seeding that exist at the extremes of both mass and redshift but they're tied to all of the other modeling elements. And so you need to model as many things as possible in order to break degeneracies. Here I've listed uh, several different observables as well as the modeling components in order that I think are most important for producing these things. And I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for at least one question. Uh, on what time scale do the uh, two black holes merge after a halo merger? Okay, yeah, so I had a, a tiny disclaimer note down here. Uh, so, I, so first of all, I assume that a uh, black hole merger occurs instantaneously when the halo merges, and the mer halo merger occurs on a dynamical friction time scale. This is the assumption that the last, last parsec problem is solved on a time scale that's shorter than that, which may be the case due to... Uh, triaxiality following that merger or from uh, gas dynamical friction. But that is a big assumption. And uh, another weird thing is that we assume that only 10% of those mergers actually happen due to uh, a degeneracy with high redshift luminosity functions and uh, the high, uh, high mass end of the M sigma relation. Turns out that in this model, if I allowed everything to merge, uh, you couldn't reproduce both of those things simultaneously. Uh, the high, high red the masses required to reproduce the high, lumino high redshift luminosity functions uh, were are like already on M sigma and therefore would overshoot if I allowed all of the mergers to occur. Let's thank Angela again. And the speaker is.